and at the uh, business action point, of course, but uh, I hope you had a chance to take a look at that. Also, you've had placed, uh, or hopefully you have placed at your uh, location there, uh, Exhibit G, which is a, uh, a streamlined version of the strategic plan issues exploration process that uh, Peter put some good thought into to help us with that. Again, we can discuss it during the business item area. I just want to be sure you're aware of it. And that brings us back to um, what has been our uh, discussion on uh, the assessment, the SBAC, its relationship to high school graduation. Uh, and I, I know that I probably uh, stopped people. Hello. I guess we're having a little bit of fun over here on the side. That's all right. That, yeah, really. Uh, so uh, we want to go back into that. And I'm sorry that we kind of, you know, we had to cut it off, but it was just uh, more on meeting management. I do have three people who wanted to continue on a train of thought there. And I probably should have written something down for each person. But uh, Holly, you were the uh, first person up. There was Connie and Isabel. And if you don't remember where you were or what your thinking pattern was, um, yeah, okay, <laughs> that's okay, that's okay. Uh, Connie or Isabel, do you remember what additional uh, information, or I mean, information isn't the right thing, but uh, what additional discussion points you had? I, I, mine was open. Okay. All right. Uh, mine was about the um, smart balance assessment. And Randy, can you remind me when that was developed? Um, my understanding was that we did have um, the tool was developed in collaboration with institutions of higher education in order to have a tool that more aligned with what the expectations are around col at least college. And again, I know we debate about the career readiness, but um, because I know there has been some question about what will this assessment really tell us about students. And I think there is one key element, right? Because we haven't had an assessment with this kind of alignment. Um, and one of the other things I would also mention, you know, there's been a lot of work done by the um, State Board of College and, and um, Technical, or CTE, or C, C College and Community Technical Colleges, sorry, um, looking at the success of students and what are the indicators of success. Um, one of the things that they've found as um, a real barrier for success of students are when students, when they start um, Community Technical Colleges, having to take remediation courses. So as they follow, follow cohorts of students, you know, then that goes back to their tipping points um, report. Um, they found that those students who end up in remedial courses often are those students who don't end up being able to complete um, a certificate or go on to um, transfer to a four-year program. And so um, here for the first time, we have an, a uh, an agreement, an, an alignment between the community technical colleges and our assessment. If a student gets a three or four, um, or we have some a school districts piloting the option around the course, if they are able to pass the course, they are they are not placed in remedial courses, and that will increase their chances of finishing either getting a certificate, which is will help them in the long run in terms of getting a livable rate, wage, or moving on to. Um, a four-year program if that's their wish. And so I think we have, even though we don't have the data about this assessment and how well students will do as they move on after they graduate, I think we have a lot of indicators to say that if they are successful, either getting a three or four, or if we create an, and, and I think this is the place where there, as a board, we can be thinking about what is another pathway Right, for, to make sure that students are actually on a pathway to be successful, I think that's the place where it's the real debate here. Um, how, you know, how do we get them on a path that even if they don't get their three or four, what is another equally meaningful way to make sure that when they graduate, they have a meaningful diploma? So all the time you have to The same study I referred to earlier um, of the students by age 26, 
it's interesting to know that only 12% of those students uh, did not go to college at some point yet during that time. So only 12% were non-college goers. The rest of them had gone at, at least for some time. So I think that uh, college ready um, that also reflects the rigor necessary for careers as well is, is the way to go. Holly. Sorry, while I recollect several scattered thoughts. Um, but I think there's there's two, two pieces of this discussion that I want to come back to. And one is, um, Isabel, you know, um, something that you said previously and kind of carried that through talking about it now. Um, you know, you, you said that part of, for you, part of um, the consideration in whether to do with the test and graduation or not is this idea that, you know, for the first time ever, we have us all pulling on the same team, right? Why? We don't want to give that up, that idea of pulling on the same team. And, um, and I think you're right. I think we are. I think the system has come around and aligned to pulling on the same team. But I don't agree that that's due to making the test an exit exam, a high stakes exit exam. If that's the case, then, you know, are we pulling on a team for all kids to pass a single test? Or are we pulling on a team for all kids, every kid, even the ones that we're not seeing reflected in our data, to come out of high school ready for a next step? And, you know, I think that when we talk about the importance of keeping it linked, we're talking about pulling on the team to make sure all kids pass a test. And if passing that test had external validation that it really meant they were ready for their next step, then, then I join that team. But I just, I keep saying this, like, you know, it's not me, it's not Tim's, it's not college remediation. You know, you just talked about the concerns around college remediation. In states that exit exams and states that don't, college remediation rates don't change. It doesn't impact college remediation, right? If it did, then I'd join your team. But instead what I see is that we have a bunch of us pulling on the get every kid to pass a test team and it's to the detriment of the we want to get all kids ready for their next step. And it's to the kids, getting all kids ready, it's to their detriment because pulling on the team of getting all kids to pass a test is actually taking resources away from the very kids we say we're concerned about. Those kids are not graduating at greater rates because we have an extra exam. So the students that graduate, so Natalie, this comes to your point earlier, when you talked about wanting a diploma that means something, what we're setting up is a system where some students are getting a more meaningful diploma, and other students still aren't getting a diploma at all. And we're taking resources away from the students that aren't getting a diploma at all. Simply making it harder is not a solution. And I've been waiting 20 years. I thought at the beginning of my career, Wendy and I had, I remember, 15 years ago, having a passionate debate with her, sitting on the campus at Western Washington University, and she was trying to tell me exit exams were not the right way to go. And I said, Wendy, if you don't make it high stakes, the whole system isn't going to buy in. You're not going to have the buy-in from students, you won't have the buy-in from teachers, and you surely won't have the buy-in from the people that have to fund the system. And I believe the only way to get that buy-in is and I've been waiting 20 years for the people that fund the system to get on board with that. 20 years, and I'm just not willing. And in the meantime, because they don't, those kids we all say we're worried about don't have the resources they need to make it, and we're not doing anything. And I don't know, 20 years is a long time to wait, I have to say, I'm pretty cynical. And if we just continue to stay the course for another 10 years, all of a sudden, they're gonna really focus on that 25% of our kids that aren't making it, and swoop back around and do what we really have to do. <coughs> I don't think the test, 20 years is long enough to prove that the threat of an exit exam or having an exit exam is going to drive funding. I, you know. Cindy. So I've, I've been asking myself a couple of questions. If the um, passing the test is linked to graduation, does it mean more kids pass the test? I think that's one of the pieces we struggle with. Will they, is there a motivation thing? Hmm. I don't know. 
Um, does it mean that our um, the diploma has more value? I, I don't know that we can say that. Um, and if our focus is on learning and teaching for learning, then I have a hard time with making a kid take a test five times and failing it. I know what we're teaching the student there. We're teaching them how to fail repeatedly. That is not one of the skills that I want us to be reinforcing for students. Especially because it seems like we're not looking for those alternative pathways at that point. And if that's what tying it to graduation has driven us to, then we are doing it wrong. And, and maybe we need to eliminate the harm that we're doing and find a different way. The test is still going to be there. If, if a student gets a three or a four, they're still going to have um, the um, option not, or the, the guarantee they won't be called upon to take remediation. I hope that that test result actually indicates they don't need remediation. I'm not totally positive that that would be the case, but we certainly would hope. Um, but I don't know that passing the test is, is going to ensure that they're going to succeed in college or in career. And I mean, if that were a gateway that we absolutely knew, if you don't pass this test, you have no chance of graduating, then maybe that would be different. But um, I know lots and lots and lots of kids who have not had to pass this test, um, or even the previous test, who've done very, very well. And I know lots of kids who have passed these exit exams who are struggling mightily out in the real world. So I'm not sure what we're accomplishing, but I see really significant um, indicators of the harm that this is doing. And I, I think we need to eliminate that harm. Um, and I think that's the reason why um, the legislative priorities of career and college ready diploma requirements is, is pretty well stated expand alternatives to assessment for high school graduation and adopt a comprehensive science assessment. Um, I think that it really states where we're at as board. I, I, I don't believe that today we're at a point where we can uh, talk about delinking. I, I don't believe that there's a consensus around that yet. Um, but I do believe that we all agree that there needs to be more and better alternatives for kids. Okay, I'm not okay. Yeah, um, so, you know, again, I, I think, I'm not sure that there's as much disagreement about this as, as we, we have. Um, if, if the question is, if they take the test, the, the real question is, if they take the test and they get a one or a two, then what happens? I don't think there's anybody at this table who says, too bad, you have to just take an infant item or you don't get a graduation uh, certificate. The question is what alternatives there are. There are a variety of other ways. I think there's interest and appetite for an expansion of alternatives, including the bridge courses, which are very promising, but we're not quite there in terms of implementation, and including possibly some kind of local course that has significant rigor. Um, but, and I, I just, um, so I, I'm comfortable with, with this as stated, leaving the opportunity to come back in January when we have a lot more information about what legislatively is on the table. Dan is, is uh, listening carefully. Um, has for the past two days, so he and the staff are, you know, and Jack, you now they've heard this discussion, so in going forward, they're gonna be thinking about this thing in terms of alternatives. We, we, we you know, we're, we're not talking um, in vain. Um, but again, I, I think that the issue is, what are the alternatives when we, when when the when the is going to take place, and then we're going to go. So I don't know that lengthy length. I'm not sure that's even necessary to go. Thank you, Holly. Uh, actually, I do oppose um, simply expanding alternatives um, because every time you add an alternative, a 
at this point in time, when we add an alternative, you are adding another unfunded mandate to districts. And it depends on what we're adding an alternative to. Are we adding an alternative to make sure that more kids can pass the test? Right now, every single alternative we have, I take that back, that's not true. Um, comparing GPAs is not um, comparing SAT and ACT, but the collection of evidence and the retaking that we have going on right now is all about passing the test. It's not about demonstrating learning, it's not about an alternative pathway, it's not about a connection to career stop passing the test. So if we're expanding alternatives, so students can pass the test, and I'm opposed to expanding alternatives. And if we're expanding alternatives to add, in addition to passing the test, um, districts are now responsible for some other, whole other program, then we got to work on that input side before we just start adding stuff. So to have a legislative priority simply to expand the alternatives, I'm not in favor of that. So uh, I'm going to weigh in here for a minute uh, and just say that um, there is uh, one word that comes to mind when this type of change occurs, and I've seen the conversation evolve over a couple of years, over several meetings, and that is messy. It is very messy. We don't want kids necessarily, uh, well, we absolutely don't want kids to be penalized, if you will, by the messiness of it. Uh, there was a law that was passed, and it did say, as we looked at this test going forward, we had this uh, high school graduation requirement for kids that was different than the career and college ready standard. There are two legislators who were tied into that bill who were saying, well, no, we didn't, we to, whatever. As the, as the law instructed us, we did that. Right now, and it, it's so early in the process, just like it was early in the process when we were talking about this, I, can, I, I, I hear Bob's voice more than anyone else's when I think about this, but it's like, this test has not even been, you know, uh, what's the right word? I don't want to say tested. This, this, this test has not even been out there for anyone to look at or do anything with. Randy went back, bought in, uh, I, I don't want to put it all on Randy, but there was a decision, kind of a national decision that Randy bought into on behalf of the, the state of Washington that tied into a set of standards to help us uh, reach a level of uh, competitive, competitiveness and capability that it is believed is needed for the future. An assessment came along as part of that process. Uh, we got to a place where we have set a high school graduation standard that at least for the early, uh, the English language arts test, um, the, the initial results of the first go round on this are promising, but we do not, just as we did a couple of meetings back with Matt, uh, this special meeting in August, I think it was, we don't have enough data yet to even say that this test is uh, going to do harm to students. Uh, not everyone's gonna pass it at once, and I get, that whole, uh, I, I get that whole piece, but at this point in time, my preference is to go beyond, even this, this year, even beyond January, to get that next round of data in because the minimum proficiency seems a highly doable option for most kids and granted there's all the issues around collections of evidence and alternatives so that's where I am. Go ahead, Cindy. And, and I just like to argue the other side of that issue. We don't know what this test really, really tells us about what kids are learning. And yet, we're going to have a group of kids who have to meet this bar now. They're not gonna get the chance to wait three or four years until we figure out the efficacy of this test. They're in the system now. And some of them are not gonna need whatever magic number a group of adults pick. Whether it's three and four, which a group of adults, you know, somewhere in the country set that, or even if it's the two plus that we picked, which, you know, we tried to use some um, data, but I still feel is a complete shot in the dark on ELA, and for math, I can't explain it to anybody how we came up with the number other than it was a number that was already it, you know, out there. So we said, sure, that number too. 
And then I look at what we saw on the screen, and I know is happening in the schools, and I know that we are at least delaying graduation for a number of students, or we're funneling in them into classes that are not educating them. They're, you know, re uh, attacking them. That's not the right word. But I mean, they're they're drilling yet again on stuff that are is at least not important to this kid, or it's not sinking in, um, and. And in many cases, we're driving them out of the system. They're, they're not graduating. They're going away. Um, the test is still going to be there. So all those great things that we get from the test, the focus, the um, accountability for the system, all of that is still going to be there. Why do we insist on harming this group we're not, we're not helping the other group of kids. They're still passing the test. Whether it's linked to graduation or not, they're still passing the test, but we are harming an entire group of them. It goes farther than that, because we actually are harming, in some cases, the kids who are passing the test, because we're having a collection of evidence class, so that teacher can't teach something that one of the kids who passed the test might like to actually take. Or um, we're, I think we have to go back and look at it from the student perspective. And there, I, I just don't see how it is that keeping it tied to graduation makes sense. And, um, so, and I know you're, you're going to do this in January, so you won't have, you won't have to listen to this again. But it, it just, I've seen the damage, and it concerns me a lot that we're continuing to do that. So, so we we've been in this test mode. It's not you know to you know to the SVAC. It's not just about the SVAC. The SVAC is a different type of test. And again, we've been in this test mode for quite a while. I thought what we did at the August meeting and helped me understand this. We we took the best data that we had available on high school graduation rates under the old system, and we tried to translate that into the new system so that to the degree possible there would be a do no harm element to that but we're not perfect either at that I, I i couldn't agree with you more about the children who do not have that opportunity to make it and get through high school and are, they have a barrier in the way to getting out the, the door but we're at this kind of quandary of the expectations that come from a variety of other places including the federal government on down the outside world, the public, that we want our kids to achieve, to reach a high level of performance and capability. So we expect you to deliver, we expect you to deliver something that will help make that happen. Granted, as we look at testing now, or however we want to call it, assessments now, it's focused in two areas. And I guess the decision has been made that those two areas initially are going to be the most important ones because we have a lot of follow-up we've been doing with them over time and science will be added later. I, I, I guess we're not in a perfect world, that's all I'll say, but I'm saying we're in a transition period. Uh, I, I think we need, to, we, need to, we need to give a little latitude to allow that transition period to occur as we did when we went from Lhasa to Hiski, et cetera. Mona. Kevin, I, I liked your statement earlier before you recognized the Heinrich and your statement about where you are. And I thought if I understood you correctly, and I'm applauding you for that, uh, that uh, you were saying we don't know enough about the system. Uh, we don't know enough about how it could benefit the system in terms of accountability or the students in terms of their growth. Uh, and uh, we don't know enough about common core standards either. So I thought you were leading to the point, why don't we take a little bit of time to really examine the data after one or two, years, one or two more years of testing before we make some grand decisions about how we use SVAC. The federal government has never said that we needed a test 
tied to graduation for two or diplomas. They've never said that. They want a statewide test for accountability. They've never told us we have to have an ex exit exam uh, in order to give a diploma. I've ne that has never been said by the federal government. If so, I'm going to have a million women march to D.C. Uh, to unelect all those folks back here. Uh, that is ludicrous, okay? Uh, if, if that's what we think we learned from the federal government. Uh, so, uh, and the last point I want to make, we've had some wonderful speakers just before we recessed for lunch. And did we hear them? I leave the answer to you. Did we hear them? Well, we had some wonderful speakers. Did we hear them? Uh, and, and, uh, Including the teacher, the regional teacher here. Yes. I, who made a plea to us. <laughs> I'm going to say that my understanding is Randy went back as the, what I'll call the chief academic officer for Washington State with the support of the legislature. I'm saying there's, there's a lot of noise coming from a lot of different levels and begins at the federal government level, the state level. A law was passed and it said here, here is, we are buying into that a career college ready score is three and above and oh by the way, we expect there will be a high school graduation score that will be different. Uh, you can infer from that 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 would be a lower score on that test. I don't want to just winnow down or narrow down on that, but what we have done to this point within the context of the law and what we're operating under is to say, we want to do no harm to children. We understand it's a transition, and when transitions occur, it can be messy. So we have given our best estimate, and that's what we did at that August meeting, to set a high school graduation standard that the vast majority of students could meet, and that's what we did. That's different from tying an exit exam to getting a I'm just, it's okay. Uh, who's up first? Holly. Oh, well, I just want to Go. clarify, because maybe I misunderstood you. Maybe I misunderstood you. You're, you're saying, you're um, advocating for leaving things the way they are while we go through a period of time and we see how it works. In other words, I want have, to have a, the score that was set in August as a graduation requirement and tied to graduation. I want to see the next set of data, which would be at the end of the, the upcoming, the current, I should say the current school year. That's me. So what's going to happen for this year? Yes, Are, we're advocating. You're advocating that they still need to pass the SAT at that level. You're you're tied. Well, it didn't count. It didn't count for graduation. I mean, it wasn't a graduation requirement. For, for you're talking about a class that just graduated. I'm I'm, I'm trying to figure. Out. You got all the way to the point of saying I want to wait and see what the results are. Okay. In the meantime. Are we, are, do you want to link or de-link passing the SBAT to graduation? I, I guess what I, I, I guess to, to you know answer that in the, in the best way that I can is to say what exists in the law now. There's a relationship between the two. I'm not ready to jump off on that yet. Okay. Holly. Okay. stakeholders say, hey, you're rushing to a decision. This is, you know, you need to get stakeholder input. This is happening really fast. Um, you know, this has been an ongoing conversation for three meetings now. It doesn't feel fast to me. Um, but <laughs> I will say, point noted, I mean, they want to be part of the conversation. They weren't here for the conversation today. So I, I know that there's, uh, the point I'm trying to make is there's a lot of expectations out there around what we're doing. But we're still mixing up the two things. We're mixing up the expectations around what the standards and assessing the standards can do for our system and for our kids. And we're mixing up expectations, or we're mixing up whether or not those expectations reside in the standards and the assessment, or whether or not those expectations are brought to fruition through linking the test to graduation. It's two different things. And I guess I would, 
it, it's it's going to make me sad if we can't come to some kind of decision around this in this meeting and then we'll wait until January. I do feel some time pressure for this because we exist right now in a political moment in time where the spotlight is on this issue. There's gonna be vehicles, I mean, it's almost assured that there will be vehicles in this legislative session that address this issue to link, be linked or not to high school graduation. And I think if we miss this moment in time, it's gonna be difficult to get it back. And I think while we wait and play it out and play it out, that moment's gonna pass us by. So I don't think we have a lot of time, but maybe if we come ready in January to make a decision around this issue or to give guidance to staff as they go out on the hill during the legislative session. So I guess I would ask if we are not ready to make a decision as a board in this meeting about the issue of linking these tests to graduate then I would ask that we come in January with some you know, fairly robust preparation and discussion between then and now. And what I want to see is, and we have half of our states in this country that don't think they're tough graduation. I don't think the chief school officers in those states are sitting around like, oh, I have all this angst that our data isn't good because our kids didn't take it seriously. I don't think that's the conversation right now. And I don't think they're looking at their scores going, if only we linked all of our kids would be not taking remedial courses in college. I, you know, I can't find a difference. And we keep ignoring that. So I want to see, because there's a cost just to linking it to graduation. There's a cost in, in the futures of our students. There's a cost to districts. And there's a there's trade off that happens all over just to keep the point. You know? And so I want to know that if we keep the link, are we really buying what we say we're buying for that price? Well, I'm going to use another M word here, but it ties into messiness, it's murkiness. And none of us can predict what the legislature is or isn't going to do. And I, I haven't shared this before, but it's been my perspective for quite a long as this began to emerge for a, a deeper conversation in this meeting. And I, I have no you know, hope of, you know, on the future or anything like that. I don't think this is going anywhere in this legislative session. I feel that a year from now, when we have that second round of data, I, I'm not going to say it's going to be perfect then either, but I'll feel much more comfortable that I'm really clear on this. And at that point, going into what is a long session, that's the time to make our mark. And if we decide we want to uh, go around a, a, a route of, uh, of saying that this assessment is wonderful for what it is, it helps kids, let's give them an incentive. We don't need to worry about anything else. Let's get the kids to graduation, that's fine. But that's been my perspective, and I know as much as you do about what will actually happen in the legislature this session. But you that's my perspective. You don't think it's a battle fought in the legislature this session, that there's bills brought forward to link or delink, and there's a battle fought, and the decision is to not delink. You think that as the state board, we have the, um, the resources or the authority to come back again I'm going, to leave, I'm going to leave there. All right. So I'm going to weigh in here. Um, you know, Holly, I appreciate the passion, you know, but frankly, I think that the, that the issue is not linking or delinking. Superintendent Dorn's proposal is not delinking. You heard him say that. The question and 2214 is not a delink bill. It becomes the question of we take the test. What are the alternatives? And by alternatives, I appreciate that, that COE is messy, costly, it may not be the only one, but is there a course? What, when I say alternatives, I mean in terms of a non-passing SBAC pathway for students who do not get a three or four. And that's the question. That gets complicated. It, 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 there are a lot of nuances. There are a lot of possibilities that I think we, we've explored over the last few days. So, you know, I, the way I see this is it's not um, this is not a yes-no kind of um, issue. It's an issue where we want to be careful to have a process that works for as many students as possible, and that involves um, other pathways, and I'm very open to the idea of, alter of, of, of expanding, but it's not so much alternatives, because alternatives sort of conjures up different tests, but different pathways for example, the bridge courses and the, the courses. So 
that's where that's where I am. Um, and you know, we, we will have a chance. We'll, we'll see what's what's. Um, my guess is this won't be the last conversation we'll have and, 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 uh, in, in the next few meetings. Um, the legislature may or not um, bring it up. Certainly by January, we're going to know if there's another bill before us, which will be concrete and um, help to define some of the possibilities. So that's what I, I, I mean. I, um, I, but again, I, I want to make sure that, that so I, I, I don't see this as a um, link or delink because I, you know, I, I don't, that's not what passed the, um, the delink did, did not pass the House. It was not introduced by uh, our superintendent of public instruction. Um, and there may be some bill out there that does that, but not, not that I've seen it. A, a perspective I have that I've shared a few times, but I just want to say it again because I feel like there is a missed opportunity in not thinking about the K-8 input in the high school graduation impact. And Holly, you said a couple of times that why, why do we have a high stakes outcome in high school but not anywhere else along the line? I mean, in theory, that is both a systems informant and a student informant, but there's some gap there that I think we need some information about so we can figure out where our advocacy position is. It's not just ample funding, it is about doing things differently with that funding mm -hmm. so that our students who arrive in kindergarten underprepared, those who are not hitting the standards along the way, get the additional instruction they need so that they really are ready to engage in this college ready confirmation process or another pathway to adulthood that is meaningful to them and will help them much better. And I know that's what we all want. But when we stay stuck on the test, I think we, we miss the larger conversation. Well said. Anybody else uh, would like to weigh in or comment at this point? Um, ben, is there anything you'd like to share? Yeah, I'm going to ask the, uh, the question. Well, I guess, um, well, I think there would be very practical points. Well, I, like, I don't, given the nature of the conversation, yeah. I could, I'm kind of feeling like it would not be appropriate for me to kind of launch into a personal thing. So, um, it, but I've got lots of thoughts. So, if, if board members had questions of me, I'd be happy to answer. I think the one thing that we do need to give to Ben and staff um, as we go through this uh, all along the way, but definitely as we leave this meeting, is direction on uh, what else we want done in this area besides sort of this fundamental question that's been out there today. So that's one thing I'll just say in, in general that we do need to provide some good direction to him on what kind of additional work we'd like staff to do in this area. And we need to be able to summarize that. Yeah, um, actually, I will say something about that. That's that's actually helpful. I can say something that's like constructive and not just purely subjective. So, um, you, you know, the the bulk of the conversation has been fairly um, uh, uh, you know, uh, link to link. You know, kind of a what's the word I'm looking for? Um, black and white. And um, the, the actual issues that emerged in the legislative session last year and that were cultivated through 2014 were quite a bit more finessed in that middle ground, um, you know, to use the Goldilocks um, metaphor, not too hot, not too cold, but where's that just right relationship between some relationship of these standards to the assessment, the assessment to the diploma, but not a hard requirement, not a soft requirement, but you know, appropriate kind of pathways and everything else. And even though there was a long discussion today, a lot of those finesse issues did not come up. And so to the extent that you wanted staff, if the direction to staff is to kind of work on some of those finesse issues, then we're gonna need some some guidance 
on that. Um, you know, if the board's inkling is to kind of go to the, uh, and I hate to characterize it as too hot, too cold, because that's short, but the hard, the hard, either either side, either polarized side of just no no relationship whatsoever, like pure dealing, and a hard requirement, which is you pass the test, you graduate, you don't, you don't, right? Um, then those are really sim relatively simplified, you know. But in reality, the, the discussion has been there in the kind of that middle finesse area, um, and there's a lot of um, important issues um, that emerge in that. For example, um, nobody's all that excited about the manner in which we, we've had to continue to give the old assessment as we have introduced the new. And the finesse ways in which you can get out of that as quickly as possible, nobody wants it, right? Continue to give those math EOCs, for example, continue to give these science EOCs. Um, yeah, it's a big deal. It's not a, it's not the big link link, you know, battle issue, but it's a big thing to solve if you were going to kind of go in the direction of the uh, that kind of the finesse middle area. There. Does this make sense? You know, so so in some sense, as you if I've been talking about these two things, um, the staff have been thinking more about these things in the middle. Um, um, Probably because that's how staff brains are wired, <laughs> um, but also, frankly speaking, if this comes up in the legislature, those are the issues um, that will make or break any particular piece of legislation. Um, probably, you know. Uh, so I thought the conversation was great. I think y'all did a great job, and I was pleased not to be part of it. And I don't mean that in a funny way. <laughs> I mean it in. Like, I think that's the way things are supposed to go. Um, but then it becomes, um, you know, the, the communication between the board and the chair and the chair and the staff in terms of um, how you want that to play out because um, staff doesn't want to be put in the position of resolving things that the board itself was, was unable to, um, either as people or professionals. So it was a great discussion, and I, I'm, I'm proud of the display that we put on today. That, that you know that people should be listening to this. This was very important to listen to, and some very articulate people with some really passionate thoughts. So that made me proud, you know, as an executive director. And, and on that note, I'm going to say I want to remind everyone that the chair sits to the right of Ben. I'm just the helper chair <laughs> today. Um, there obviously will be time for discussion because you do that with each item, but uh, we'll go ahead, Cindy. I wanted to move to a different topic, and I want to apologize because I had to leave yesterday because I was feeling well. But was there in the legislative priorities, is it all right to just ask some yeah, questions that's about those? Um, in particular, the, um, the message that um, we're taking to the legislature on the clery one of the major um, issues that's going to have to be sorted out in, in um, staff compensation is this question of regional differentiation. Did we take, have we discussed a position on that or are we going to stay away from that? I have never said one word about that. Um, uh, I, it's not, I'm not aware that we've ever had a discussion as a board about it. Um, the one thing I have talked about is, you know, the legislature needs some strategy of demonstrating that these local levies are not paying for basic education services. And that gets you into the question of salary. And, you know, what's basic at salary? What's not basic at salary? What's basic at program? What's not basic? Some of these lines are not super clear. Um, but one way or another, Pouring more money into the system without creating strategies to segregate is is going to you know recultivate the same issue over and over. Um, but I think that the regional salary, the regional salary thing is almost a purely political. Um, you know, it, it's just how do you want to spend your money? You know. Uh, so so, uh, somebody else. so with that, uh, go ahead, Holly. 
clarifying question around the career and college ready diploma requirements as written the legislative sure. priority. Um, so the first sentence is the board reviews the legislature to expand the alternative um, to include successful completion of transition courses and dual credit courses. And I think, you know, Ben, your point's taken that those pieces in the middle, there's a whole bunch of things that we, you know, on the member survey um, that we uh, thought about that we never really got to. And this is one of them. And I think I don't understand that sentence. So, so what's the vision there? Do, so if, it, if a student didn't pass SF, but they took a college in the high school math class, that would count? as meeting the requirement? Yeah, so... Um, Being uh, college in your high school? Yeah, well, let's, I mean, I, uh, I'm hesitating because Linda's not here, and I had to send, by the way, I had to send Linda home for a personal issue. She's fine, and, but that's, so you're not wondering where she is. Right. It, it was, it's uh, all on the up and up. Uh, she'll be fine. Um, yeah, so we're, uh, where you landed last year in your statement, your uh, uh, assessment position statement. Um, if you could, for those of you that were around, you know, it was, a, it was a, exactly a year ago. Um, at that time, there was there was a a concern about okay, well, collections of evidence might be a a good alternative way for kids to demonstrate proficiency, but you do have these situations, particularly when you've got science, where kids could be doing three of these things. And if they're classes, that's three extra classes. Um, and so there was kind of the pressure of over-reliance on collections as the only real viable volume alternative. Um, and I think you saw today that you know, Thousand kids get that way, about six thousand, six thousand. Um, and so your conversation last year was about um, how could you um, release the, make the collections effectively one of a series of, of options where students could demonstrate uh, readiness, not effectively the option. Now there are other options, you know, the GPA comparison. We have like 60 kids, you know. Um, you know, there's a couple others to do the SAT, ID. We get a few hundred kids that way. But, you know, then we got, you know, 10,000 kids taking the collections, you know. And um, so at the time, the idea was, well, what if a kid, uh, you know, attempts the uh, exit exam, and if they're not uh, a success on that, give them a shot at taking a class that is a post-secondary credit-bearing class, and if they succeed in that, well then by God, they've demonstrated that they're ready for credit-bearing coursework at the post-secondary level. They just took the course, right? College and high school, um, there's some tech prep programs that generate post-secondary credit. Obviously, any AP or ID, but, but that's less the running start. And so the thought was, um, you know, if Collections of evidence is a class that's kind of heavy on the summative and less on the formative. Are there classroom class-based solutions that are heavier on the formative and less on the summative? With a couple of examples that I gave, as well as the bridge to college courses. You know, I think most of the board members that were around the table last November were were actually pretty enthusiastic about the idea of having a student take an exam if they're not successful, give them the opportunity to demonstrate their proficiency through this specially designed course that has parameters and rigor around it. It's not just any course, you know, it's not just take, you know, take whatever course, but it's a specially designed course. Um, and we left the November, or excuse me, we left the January meeting endorsing those classes, if I'm not mistaken, Mr. Director, as a, um, as something that could be included in the law on par with a collection as a um, as a uh, approved alternative of the state. And so the vision of it, the vision of it was that rather than relying so heavily on collections, that you would dilute the reliance on collections. And you have various class-based options uh, that students could avail themselves of. 
the Bridge to College being one of them. We will credit Running Start, uh, Class to College and High School being others. And then that passed the straight face test because after all, they are college courses. If they succeed in a college course, they have demonstrated they're ready for career, you know, college readiness. Uh, that's where you landed last year in a, in a lengthy statement that you can, you can read again, but it, it, it was uh, for, very clear about that. Um, and for whatever it's worth, I think that's pretty thoughtful. Now, the, the, the problem with that is that session came around and it went in the opposite direction. It wasn't about expanding alternatives, it was about eliminating them. It was about eliminating collections, it was about eliminating all, all alternatives and just saying it was no longer linked to high school graduation. You would have to take a course, the course would be um, of, I mean, there, was, there was a substitute hanging in the wings that was maybe going to strengthen the definition of what constituted that senior course. But, um, you know, at the end of the day, the priority of the statement that you adopted last November, and the kind of the spirit of what uh, 2214 was trying to do, was not that far off. It was not that far off. Uh, but it was off. It was different in very, you know, demonstrable ways. Uh, and so I, you know, again, from a, from a staff viewpoint, from a kind of an analytical staff viewpoint, um, whereas there are kind of thunderous arguments on both sides, you know, in terms of the diametrically opposed, the actual legislative debate was quite a bit more nuanced in the, in the particular means by which a student um, would be able to demonstrate having that standard to a classroom-based Same. Since we're on this particular legislative um, priority, um, I'm being a lawyer. I would like to wordsmith it just a little tiny bit. Um, in that first sentence, um, could we could we say the board urges the legislature to expand alternatives for seniors? I'm, I'm a little concerned about the phrase testing alternatives. Um, I mean, it includes testing, because we were talking about ACTs and SATs, but then having listened to your very articulate um, reminder to us, it also is talking about classes or, or collections of evidence. So um, I think maybe it does, it's not as inclusive as we might want. And then at the end of that line, instead of saying the 11th grade, because we've talked about maybe we need to look at when this test is administered, could we say the word high school? So the high school SVAC test, so that we're not implying that we think it needs to stay at the 11th grade, but we're staying open to the idea that that still needs to be um, contemplated. Hang on a yeah, uh, Jack was reminding me something. And since we're on the record and everything else, so your position statement last year about the dual credit courses stipulated the um, uh, that it wasn't just all and every dual credit course, but it was courses that met requirements under a particular set of laws. So anyway, I just didn't want it to be a sure. And and I think. You know, that's clearly something that you will remind. Yep. Like, we will resend out the uh, position to the last year. You guys look at it. Janice, just a, a minute, I want to say, Cindy, I, I think those are um, uh, thoughtful things to include. When we bring up the legislative priorities is the action item, we can start to go, oh, that's my thing. It's good to have this in advance, but get to that word smithing at that point. Janice. Wordsmithing is not exactly what I want to do, but I think every time we talk about expansion, we should say funding in every way. Just just the largest one because the, the legislature is busy not funding that in a lot of ways. And then I wonder if some test alternatives actually say the outcomes. The outcome is demonstrating proficiency in those standards. And that we might want to start using language, and there's five better places now, but we might want to start using language of that kind to signal the goal or the outcome that we're going after, which is not, again, not passing tests, 
but demonstrate the proficiency again as we see our students in the I want to be sure I understand that. Um, where would you plug outcomes in here? Um, to expand alternatives to demonstrate proficiency as opposed to testing. Okay, thank you. I want to be sure I understood that. Thank you. Holly, oh, I'm sorry, did I get you guys out of order? Moment. Okay, you'll, you'll, you'll yield. Okay, thank you. why the conversation really was so hard to me because I think um, you know when you talk about the conversation here the conversation here there's, there's it's black and it's black and white and it's um, less nuance is required but there's also a lot less gray and a lot less uh, unintended outcomes and a lot less or unknown outcomes unknown. for me unknown not unintended but unknown but but I also think I mean I look at this and I wonder You know, here, here's the part, here's the dilemma for me. So it makes sense to me to increase the alternatives that are already in existence, allow students to take advantage of them. That makes total sense to me. But there are districts that are offering currently dual credit courses. And there's districts that are already piloting the, um, the transition courses. And there's districts that will be early adopters of those transition courses. They'll have the staffing and the funding and the climate and all of those things. But if we expand alternatives, and these are primarily for students that are on the, you know, these are the twos that are just about to get to three probably, right? These are, we're talking about college level type options or college prep sorts of options, right? Are we increasing the inequity in the system? Some students in some districts will have access to these and students in other districts will only have the collection of evidence, right? So we continue to just build the inequity into the system. I mean, I, I would also say on the flip side, I hope that as we look at adjustments to the clery and funding, that some of that inequity will work its way out financially speaking. Well, I'm sorry, I'm not sure. I'm just talking. Are we voting uh, this afternoon on all of these legislative priorities? Are we setting some of them aside? Uh, at, at this point, uh, they will all be brought forth in an action item. And then if the board chooses to pull one aside, that's that's certainly within its purview. Okay. And my follow-up is, and this is not going to be what we've been talking about for hours, uh, and that is uh, the board urges the legislature to expand testing alternatives to students who do not pass the 11th grade SBAC test required for graduation. I don't think we can try to the SBAC test required for graduation. Thank you. Peter. So, um, Cindy, thank you for your suggestions. I think that's helpful in terms of expanding to, to make this somewhat less, um, less narrow in its scope in terms of, uh, I would support that language. I, in terms of what I would like to see um, in the staff working on between now and January, personally, uh, you, definitely what you talked about, Ben, in terms of other pathways, GPA is another possibility. There, there, there are a number of possibilities there. But one thing, um, and, and, and a star on this question of 10th grade, I don't think we've received enough information, particularly from the superintendent's office, about pros, cons, possibilities, um, and, and I think we would benefit from having more information on that. Um, the, the possibility of moving it to 10th grade. Oh, yeah. yeah, and, and I, I appreciate, Robin was here yesterday, not here now, but there, um, we need more, I, I feel we need more information about that. And the other is, I don't think it needs to go in the uh, legislative priority, but it was certainly voiced, and I think we need to think about the students who are not who are the level one, the ones who, who are really struggling, and the, the, the whole testing thing actually sort of, to them, I mean, it's a, they're elsewhere. So I, I, I want to make sure that that doesn't get lost in this discussion, because I think that we as a policy body, we need to be thinking about those too. Um, that's not an immediate legislative thing, but I, um, it's, it's a whole group of students who are and also deals with, it intersects with the credits as well because they're the same kids who struggle with credits. So 
Um, I, I, I just I throw that in the mix. I think it's something we want to continue to think about how we, as a system, address those um, those issues. So at this point, what we'll do is we'll move to the business items. I am going to recommend that we switch item four and item seven, simply because I think that's often you know, how it works. We'll have a little more conversation about item four, even as we go through it, if that's acceptable. And Kevin, are we going immediately to the business items, or sometimes we sort of like preview with Oh, well, I mean, we have this. I'm sorry. What do you mean? We do have discussion in the uh, in the context of each business item, so we'll have information up on the screen. Is that what you're asking about? For you? Specifically, you need a motion, and then you have discussion. I mean, if you're thinking about it in that basic. Well, point. okay. Then I just want to get heads up. I, I, sometimes I just want to get heads up to the group about where what, what I'm going to do anyway, so you're not surprised. In that. Um, so one is. Um, the, the last sentence of the career and college diploma requirements, I raised the question about the dates there, and I believe Jack has some new language which he's going to substitute, which is a little, which is tied to what LSPI is going to do, and it's, it's uh, less specific about the dates. We can, you know, you can accept that or not, but there's that. Um, secondly, I intend to offer an, uh, an amendment to the legislative priorities that deals with, uh, have another statement about alignment of um, our compensation system for educated or teachers with the um, the career ladder, along with PESB, and you can see that. So just and it'll, it'll, and you provide that. I guess now be coming. Um, okay. And then and thirdly, there is the um, there is the um, I think you all have it the exactly. of the process here. And I'm if, if if anybody has specific issues with it, you know, please. Look, I'd rather I, I think it'd be better not. If, if there's something worth sniffing on that, um, let us know, please. Thank you. Okay. Paula? Just the process question. Haven't we in the past approved each legislative priority separately in terms of board sniffing and amendments and doing all of those pieces with it rather than as a package? I, I think we, I, uh, yeah, I think we did that last time around, and I, I, I don't per se have an issue with that. I don't know what the board's pleasure is, but we would talk about part of what I tried to do yesterday so that when we got down with that, go ahead, Jim. Yeah, so I think last year what we did was we took the whole document and we said, okay, which of these, are there any suggestions at all, right? And then so maybe there's, you know, three that are just on their face fine, everybody's fine with them. I think they voted those right away and then they worked individually on the ones that, that uh, for, for which there were issues, you know, language or a whole new proposal or whatever, so. You understand what I'm saying? I do, and I, yeah. I'm wondering, I mean, does it, does it make sense to try to do that a little? Because I see one motion on the business items approval of the legislative priorities to keep right. it all we, together. Right, just so we, because we could knock three out with with a motion, and then we work individually on That's exactly right. So at yeah. what point in the process would we represent it? And how would we separate out those motions? Would that be part of that yeah. discussion? Right. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we won't we won't lump everything together when people have an issue with a particular one. I think so. Proceed. So uh, let's see. Are we ready to show stuff up on the screen? Okay. Five. Yeah. Five. Good stuff. Oh, sorry. I thought they were all ready to go. I thought they were ready. Some people. I thought so. My my bad. Okay. Take five. Okay. So.
Okay. So. So, uh, Parker, Parker, when we determine which of the legislative priorities are just knockouts, we'll include those, like, I, I imagine saying, like, okay, motion on exhibit A, B, and C, and A, B, and C will be those items that, right, so they'll be separate exhibits, but we can motion all of those at once, get them off the table, and then the ones that people have issue with, okay? Once you decide to separate them, I'll give you the exhibit to elaborate on it for the motion. Fine, and you can put it on the screen. Can I talk at people while we're kind of, is there Cindy Love? Kevin, can I at least tell you my plan? Well, Cindy, yeah, go, for it. go for it. We're, we're, okay. we're. So your action sheet has eight items on it? Okay. Do you, okay, your action sheet has eight items on it. I think four, we should just, I think they're, they're we can knock them out. Okay. So I would I would recommend going out of order, taking four of them, getting